Welcome to the Ethnic American channel. Today we're going to be talking about how bronze ethnic American women in the 1800s actually owned land and how that spurred a lot of the interracial marriages that happened during that time. So this in the picture, this woman is Elizabeth Fourth, and she is said to be the first quote unquote African American woman landowner in the US. She was not the first because in our American societies in the North, the South and the middle, you know, middle America, we were already owning and trading land because we had actual governments to where we, you know, decided we made decisions on what we were going to do with the land, who was going to be allowed on it or do what with it. Okay. The Mongoloid Indians were already a migratory people that didn't have ties to the land or any one place. However, we did. That's why we had to actually be pushed off of our lands and what, what is now called the, the Trail of Tears. That actually did not apply to the Mongoloid Indians. That applied to us because there are millions of us over here. And the Trail of Tears basically uprooted and upended thousands upon thousands of bronze people who had subsisted off of the land and they did not want to give it up. Elizabeth Fourth herself, after she had freed herself by, um, oh, by the way, she was born in Michigan. She freed herself by running away up north to Canada, then coming back to Michigan because at the time, Michigan had a law stating that you could not go back to becoming a slave if you went to Canada and then came back to the United States. So she ended up being free and working for a Caucasian family for about 30 years, and that family taught her how to invest in stocks. And with that money she accumulated, eventually she bought over 40 acres of land. Now, she did this during the 1800s when so-called slavery was going on and supposedly bronze people couldn't own any land because they said they, you know, they passed, you know, laws saying, well, you know, so quote unquote black people are not considered citizens, which is interesting because we were not called black people back then. And if you read the actual Emancipation Proclamation, it doesn't specifically mention, quote unquote, black or African American people as being free. It just gives sla slaves in general, no matter what color you were, the right to choose an employer or today, by today's standards, it still would be a slaver. Because back then you couldn't choose who you worked for. But after that, then technically the that, that only thing that meant was that you now you can choose who you work for. So at this time, she owned over 48 acres of land and she passed it on to her children. That is an inheritance, okay? So we all know that the Mongoloid Indians were the ones who said that they did not own land and that no one individual held ownership over it or had personal property. In fact, the same mindset is said of the tribal Africans as well. So if we were taken from Africa and brought over to the Americas, wouldn't we still have that same mindset of, hey, you don't control or own this land, you can't pass it down as an inheritance or have a deed or a will or anything like that because, you know, you didn't make the land, right? But we had that in our societies. We had land ownership in our society because we had governments. The Mongoloid Indians were a migratory people that lived off of the land. In our Aztec and Mayan societies, as you can see here, we had land ownership. As we read here about the Mayans, communal lands were owned by the nobles and ruling class and were worked by commoners. Commoner families were also permitted to own small parcels of land that they used for subsistence agriculture. This land could be passed down to the owner's sons. The Aztecs had a complex and hierarchical land ownership system and drew sophisticated boundary maps that were used to mark different types of land and settle disputes. The emperor owned personal and royal property which was used as he saw fit. As you can see, once again shown we did own an inherent land in our ancient societies. That is how we were able to attain control of so much land before it was bought or taken from us by these foreigners. Because how, ask yourself this, how could slaves buy or inherit land. The Europeans were just arriving here in small numbers, so who was controlling most of the land? It wasn't the Mongoloid Indians, because they didn't believe in having ties to the land to, to the point where you owned it or you controlled it. They were not farming. They did not have agriculture. They were roaming. It was us who was controlling the land. 
the Mayans and Aztecs were not Mongoloid Indians because once again, the Mongoloid Indians did not own land. But they said that the Mayans and the Aztecs were the indigenous people. And then they say the Mongoloid Indians here were indigenous people. So, well, these are two contradicting cultures here. You have one culture who has a whole entire government and society and civilization and land ownership and land inheritance. And then you have the Mongoloid Indians over here who just basically roamed the land and lived off of it and subsisted off of it. And they could be just driven off if whoever decides to come in and take the land over wanted them to be gone. But when they tried to do that to us, we fought because we had actually stayed and farmed upon the land. So that's what had occurred with the Gullah Wars and a lot of the revolts that were happening. Those revolts were not just slave revolts. Those revolts of people fighting to stay on their land because you had foreigners trying to come and move us or kill us or push us off of the land. But we're gonna continue on. So meanwhile, and for hundreds of thousands of years, our us as bronze women were able to own land in our society and the European misogynistic and the Asian and everybody else basically, their females could not own or control land. And here in the United States, they actually had to pass an act called the Married Women's Property Act of 1848. Okay, which is one of the most important property law enactments in American history. It was important because it was important for them. Like I said, we were already owning land over here. It had nothing to do with us. It became the template for the laws passed in other states that allowed women to own and control properly, property. Excuse me. Prior to the enactment of the New York law, if a woman's father left property to a married daughter, it fell into her husband's control. For this reason, many women's marriageability was assessed by how likely they were to inherit significant property from their fathers. Okay? That is how Caucasian females' marriageability was assessed land. That's what it was about. It's not about love. You had these foreigners coming over here who were poor. They did not have time for love. They were trying to get land so they could get some money. Okay? But who owned the vast majority of the land, it was us. Now, by the early 1900s, apparently, bronze land ownership had accumulated to around 19 million acres of land. And this included, quote unquote, freed slaves, okay? It wasn't just slaves, you had freedmen, people who had never been slaves, okay? That's why you have so many of our grandparents and great-grandparents, if you go and ask them, do their parents or grandparents have stories about slavery? Many of them will say no. So there were not a lot of us as quote unquote slaves as you might think or that is taught in history class. Most of us had the land to live off of. We did not need to slave and work for somebody else when we already had the land. Okay. So the bronze people and their descendants had accumulated about 19 million acres of land by the early 1900s, okay? That means there was a process of buying all of that up. So as we read here, despite increasing segregation and land ownership disputes, black farmland ownership steadily increased in the late 1800s, okay? It actually started in the 18, mid to early 1800s in general, like with Elizabeth IV. Once again, she was not the first, how to kid you even decide on them. We were already owning land and our civilizations here. So you gotta ask, where were we, especially the single bronze women and the widowed bronze women, where were they getting the money to buy up so much land if all we did was pick cotton and do manual labor? Well, we got the money from getting paid from skilled labor. We had skills. We didn't come over here from, from Africa because if you were just taking from a tribe in Africa and come over here, you have no real skills. I've seen that meme people, you know, talking about they didn't they didn't take slaves from Africa, they took astronomers and herbalists and all that. So I'm like, okay, but you're in a land that you've never been in before. No, they didn't take those people because they could not communicate with those people effectively to say, hey, we need a woodsmith, we need a carpenter, we need a metal worker. You're really gonna go to the head of a tribal uh, African or African tribe and tell them that that's who you need 
why don't you get your own European people who are supposed to be skilled and bring them over here because most of the immigrants that came over here, if not all, did not have any skilled labor. That's why they had to also work as slaves. There were actually more Caucasian slaves than there were bronze slaves, by the way. And again, that's what spurred the interracial marriages. We had most of the land. And that's another way we got paid. We had businesses and we sold we sold farmed food from the land that we already had. Or we leased the land. Like in Elizabeth Fourth's biography that you can find online, she actually leased the land to her brother to farm on. As we read here, and I want to really focus in on this, African American women emerged as landowners during this period of by the 1900s through inheritance and through individual and collective efforts. This big thing is inheritance here. That means somebody else up the line or down the line had already brought bought some property and passed it on to their children and their children and so on and so forth until it got to them. And also some landowners, moreover, were single women who sought to establish security for themselves. And then continued on to enhance the institutional structure of the community, women, particularly those who were widowed, benefited from the various means by which these institutions inculcated saving to buy land. Women like men maintained deep-seated aspirations to invest in land. Land was a tangible manifestation of their independence as well as an asset that might strengthen kinship and family ties. In spite of economic hardships, African-American women in Savannah, Chatham County, this is specifically talking about Savannah, but this happened all over the United States, became landowners. By 1876, 117 African-American women in Chatham County, some of whom were ex-slaves, owned land. Now, how could all these bronze women, not even bronze men, but bronze women, own so much land at a time when you had impoverished immigrants and Caucasians coming over here and they had nothing. This is one reason why many Caucasian males would either marry or rape bronze women so that his offspring would be loyal to him and then he would gain control of that land via inheritance. Because you know the offspring, the mulatto, is going to be heavily influenced by the father to then get with another Caucasian, preferably of their own ethnic group. So if the father is, let's say, Irish, he'd want his child to get with an Irish woman or Irish man. So now the bronze woman has lost the land that her family inherited to her that she bought. See, you couldn't do that with a bronze man, you know, marrying a foreign foreigner woman like a Caucasian or Asian woman they weren't as manipulatable I guess you could say but back then when you see a lot of those interracial marriages and you know, these articles talking about you know their love and they fought for their love to be recognized and fighting to get the license because let me ask you this why do you need a license from the government so bad if it's just if it's about you and your love you don't need a license from the government you live together and be a married couple. And so this is your husband, this is your wife. You know, who cares what they say? If it was about love, but no, a lot of these people fought to get the license so that legally they could inherit the land. In comparison, not only were the English and the French and all the other Caucasians were doing that in North America, the Spanish were doing it when they came to South America too. As we read here, Levi Strauss also suggests that members of the dominant group will accept wives as a symbol of peace, but will not exchange their own women. So what he basically is talking reference to is the Spanish conquistadors that were coming over from Spain would not have their women, some of them didn't even bring their women until much, much later on once they took control of South America and our empires in that area had, fell, had fallen. They were marrying our women or marrying us over here because they wanted to make the mulattoes who would be loyal to Spain and they literally say it right here it says here these pressures were necessary if the colony was to be stabilized and the children of these unions were to be raised to identify with Spain 
It also says here in these two other highlighted passages, to encourage intermarriage between Spaniards and Indians in central Mexico, the Spanish crown awarded military officers and soldiers more acreage than was commonly assigned. Moreover, the crown increased its pressures on Spanish men to marry Indian women by penalizing those who had concubines and refused to wed. So you could not have a concubine, you had to legally marry to get control of the land. A soldier who had a concubine was required to marry within three years of receiving his encomienda or risk losing the property. Don't you see? They were all working together to get the land. So the French, the French, the majority of the land that the French took, they took Canada. The British took the United States area. And then the Spanish took South and Middle America. Don't you see? They're all working together, all doing the same thing, coming over here, marrying the women to gain control of the land. But you know they were not marrying Mongoloid Indian women because they did not own land. They said, they said you can't own the land, but so who was owning it? It was us. You see it on the murals, the Mayan and the Aztec murals, the figurines. Those are clearly us, the ethnic bronze Americans quote-unquote, the blacks, African-Americans, we are not African. Those were us. They had to marry us, but they had to get the women because the men were not having that. Do you really think that a man who has all this land is going to get with some legally marry a foreign woman and allow her son to then marry another foreign person, woman, and then inherit that land so that it can be owned by Spain? No, 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 they're not going to do that. So they had to get the women. The women were more amiable, unfortunately. And then let's ask another question too. The Spanish conquistadors, if they had all the firepower and they were so strong and mean and bloodthirsty and were just killing us all over the place, why didn't they just do that? Why are they trying to marry us to get control of the land? Why not just come in and sweep over and kill everybody and take the land by force? Because there weren't enough of them. There weren't enough of them. There were too many of us. But what they say, they said there are about, about what, 10 million of us just living in modern, what we would consider modern day Mexico. 10 million of them didn't come over here from Spain. They didn't have an army that big. Did we have conflicts and bloody conflicts? Oh yeah. But it was not conflicts like that all over the place consistently. They did not have the manpower to do that. That's why it says here, the group will accept watch as a symbol of peace because they didn't have the manpower to fight us. So they said, hey, you know, maybe we'll just, we'll just come and be nice. We'll try to integrate. You know, we'll marry, we'll marry their women so that we can have this mulatto who will be like the bridge between the Americans and the Spanish. But really, the child will be loyal to us. So this is why you had so many mulattoes running around. And who did the mulattoes become in modern day? They became what we would call the Mexicans in South America. And in North America, a lot of the mulattoes just got mixed out with Caucasians because they didn't have enough of each other to kind of, you know, mix with. And it was really encouraged, heavy in the United States, we know, to have lighter skin. So they made sure, the, the mulatto made sure to get with the Caucasian. And that's how we lost a lot of the land. Not only through being murdered, whole families being murdered by some, you know, racist Caucasians who want to take the land or deeds and paperwork being burned or stolen or what have you. Um, a lot of it was just lost through interracial marriages. I'm going to play this video here uh, by Dane Calloway on YouTube. Okay, this is where I got the clip from so you can check him out on there also. Just so you can see what I'm talking about when I say these immigrants, these Caucasian immigrants were very poor, okay? And that's why they married us, not because they loved us. They were still racist. That's why they still call their children niggas. They did it because they were poor and they needed some land. 
So let's watch this one. In order to become established, they saw the beautiful lives that the Niji had already established. And because we were not sharing with these strings, started as being niggardly, which is an extremely stingy person. Hold up, hold up. Just because we didn't want to help them. Established. And because we were not sharing with these strangers or being open towards their standards, we were regarded as being niggardly, which is an extremely stingy person. Just because we didn't want to help them. They called us niggas. Coming from niggardly. I'll pause this right here a second. If we were slaves brought over here during the transatlantic slave trade off of ships as Africans, when he, we didn't have clothes on our backs, but we had land, in fact, we had so much land that when these foreigners came over here and said, give us the land and we didn't want to give it to them, that's when they called us niggers. It had nothing to do with a black person that's where the word nigger comes from. An extrem extremely stingy person. Because we didn't want to give them the lands, but how do we get the land in the first place? If we came from Africa with nothing. We had the land because we've been had the land. We've been inheriting the land. And by the way, we had money. When you see a lot of the, the pictures of bronze people all the way up until the civil rights movement, we had money. We were dressing good eating well, we had land. The ones who were broken and impoverished were the Caucasians. They, the Caucasians and the foreigners in general, did not get the wealth they had until about the 1950s after World War II and the creation of the credit card and the lending system for consumer debt. That's how they were able to get out of poverty. And they've only been out of poverty for 70 years. We'll get into that in another video. We've had riches for hundreds of thousands of years. They just got here. Just. Huh? Cause we didn't want to help them. We made you feel sorry for them by giving you religion. And what are they saying in Christianity? It doesn't matter, <laughs> it really. It doesn't matter what race you are. When you're a Christian, you can marry whoever you want to marry, right? That's another reason why they pushed religious on us so hard. It made us soft. It made us soft so that they can soften you up saying this, this is a divine union from God and then take your land and make sure that their immigrant family gets it. They tell their child, make sure you get with this person this, so they can get the land and then you won't have it anymore. he sent the children in because Elizabeth IV, who we talked about in the beginning of the video, grew up around not only her brothers and sisters and played with Caucasian and Mongoloid Native American children. In fact, it says here she never learned to read or write, but she was bright and was said to catch on to ideas very quickly and to have learned the Indian languages. She was even able to serve as a translator at times between the Indians and others who could not understand them. How could that be? Hmm. But no African languages. Not a single one. And she's all the way up in Michigan, by the way. She was born in Michigan. She grew up in Macomb County, Michigan, on the Huron River in St. Clair. That's a far, far away from the East Coast where they said that these slave boats landed. So a lot of bronze people, especially bronze women, um, especially if they were in up north, New York, Michigan, those places, 
or even further west they didn't really experience racism like that they didn't you would think that every you know caucasian or immigrant person coming over here was at least they weren't outwardly racist if they were they hit it but a lot of them weren't that's why we could integrate with them so easily because they were nice and a lot of the bronze children the real ethnic american children grew up around those caucasian children and so they were already comfortable they saw no wrong in marrying someone outside of their race especially if they were raised in a christian household that would be a divine union to them it wasn't so divine when they lost the land though but of course they weren't thinking that far ahead the bronze women were more success susceptible to being lured by you know thoughts and acts of love and romance and such and basically being finesse okay let's just say it and so you could have a poor caucasian male marry a bronze ethnic american woman who was relatively you know rich she was she had more than him she had money she had land and so in a time where you would think that marriage would not be licensed, in a lot of cases they were, they just don't tell you about it. And they were licensed because the person who was allowing the license really knew what was up. He really knew what was going on and said, hey, this mulatto child is going to make sure that this male's English family, British family, Spanish, French family, whoever, German family, would get that land. And then when they immigrate over here, they already have a place to go. They don't have to be indentured servers and slave and work for somebody else for X amount of years or for the rest of their lives because they already have claim to ownership over here. And with having claim to land over here, you could easily become a citizen. Uh, before we go, before, this is just for anybody who thinks, oh, there couldn't have been a significant amount of interracial marriage going on because I don't see the pictures, I don't see the depictions, I don't see the records. Well, I'm going to tell you one thing. Um, first of all, we got to remember that the province of a mulatto was with an Indian and a Caucasian back then. Okay? We were not called black, we were called Indians or Americans. They changed the name later on. We were known as Indians. So, before we go, we're going to read this quick passage from Interracial Marriage in Early America, Motivation in the Colonial Project by Karen Mann. So you can see it says here, the marriage of Rolf and Pocahontas was one among thousands of interracial marriages found in the annals of American history. The 1700s French census of France's North American subjects those were the people that, you know, the French who came over to North America and the French colonies shows that over 50% of marriages were interracial. And looky here, the most typical examples of interracial marriage in this period occurred between Indian women and white men. And then the author even asks the question in light of broader relations between whites and Native Americans at the time, because there was a lot of friction going on, why did these marriages occur? What was to be gained? I'll tell you what was to be gained, land. When they say Indians, in reference to back then, they were not talking about the Mongoloid Indians. They were talking about us. That was the drive for the marriages. It was the land. 50%, over 50% were interracial. It was just most of the immigrants coming over here were men, the males. They did not bring their French females over here. It was just the male. So who do you think they're going to marry? They're going to marry the Indian women, us. Because it was the male who controlled and owned the land in the United States legal system. And that's all for today. We'll see you next time on the next episode of Ethnic American Channel.